Bismillah walhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la wa ba'd Assalamualaikum warahmatullah In tonight's lecture we're going to be reflecting on the verses from the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about Ibad al-Rahman the servants of al-Rahman the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah talked about Ibad al-Rahman in which surah of the Quran? Surah Al-Furqan from verses 63 to 77. And how many characteristics did Allah mention of Ibad al-Rahman? This is something, inshallah ta'ala, if you don't already know, we're going to reflect on it together and we're going to add them up, inshallah ta'ala. So pay attention. And perhaps it's going to be difficult to finish all of them unless we go through them very fast. So we're going to, inshallah, we're going to divide it into two uh, sittings, inshallah ta'ala. This week and next week, and then we'll finish all of them. Uh, when we read these ayat about Ibad al-Rahman, it's important that we realize that there's many qawaid or principles that we're being taught as Muslims of how we need to act, how we need to think, how we need to... Uh, act in certain situations. So how do we walk, for example, as believers? We're taught in these verses. وَعِبَادَ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ, عَلَى الأرض هونن. And the ibad of Rahman, the servants of Rahman, the ones who walk upon the earth easily. How do I reply in a situation where someone comes and they insult me? How do I, how do I reply to them? وَإِذَا خَاطَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا and if the ignorant people address them, meaning harshly and cursing at them, saying ignorant things to them, then they reply to them with words of peace. There's another principle that I learned. How do I deal with falsehood? And those who do not testify to the falsehood. So if I come by falsehood, I know how to deal with it now because I have a principle which I've learned from these sifat, from these characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman. What happens when it comes and I'm, I'm in a place of ill speech, where there's ill speech being made? And if they pass by ill speech, they pass by with dignity. Inshallah, we're going to discuss each one of these in detail. So these verses lay down for us qawaid or principles of how the believer needs to live his life, how one walks, how one talks when he's insulted, how one worships, the dua of the believer, how we should spend our money, how should we be when it comes to our belief, our tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshiping Allah as one without joining any partners to Him. What are some of the things that we need to refrain from? Some of the major sins like shirk, unjustly killing uh, uh, an, an innocent individual. It's mentioned in these verses. Also, when it comes to staying away from fornicating, staying away from adultery, the zina, also staying away from falsehood, ill speech, the repentance of Ibad al-Rahman, and the impact that the ayat, the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have upon the true believers. All of these things are the things we're going to learn in the characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman. These verses also teach us the outcome. The outcome, Yawm al-Qiyamah, it's going to be one of two. The outcome is going to be a severe punishment from those who fall into the major sins mentioned in the ayat, <coughs> or it's going to be great reward for the ones who come and implement the teachings of these verses and have the characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman. May Allah make us all from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Also, subhanAllah, there's something we'll mention at the end of next week's lesson, inshallah. But there's an amazing tadabbur, reflection on these ayat. And that is regarding the number three. Three things are mentioned in several different verses in the ayat. And pay attention to that. If you know what it is, alhamdulillah, if not, then go home tonight and reflect on the verses so you'll be prepared next week, inshallah. So give you some homework. Huh? It says, it's, it's our weekend, we're taking some time off to reflect on some of the ayat, reflect on the characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman. But this is a good homework. It's a beneficial homework. It's a homework you'll find pleasure in. You go back to these ayat and reflect. What is this three we're talking about? What are the three things? Three for three. It's very interesting, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll talk about it at the end of the, end of the lesson next week, inshallah. The first characteristic, wa'ibad al-Rahman, 
الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا And the servants of Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, that walk upon the earth easily, هُونًا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls these individuals عباد Rahman, that means they have a very special status. They're close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're close to Allah and they have a very special status because they're the ibad, the servants of Ar-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when one is reading the Quran, we're reading in Surah Al-Furqan, and we come to these verses, the important question, and we said when we reach these verses, when we're reading the Quran, it's important that we stop and ask ourselves, why does Allah mention these characteristics? When he says, Ibadur Rahman, we know they have a special status now. Why does Allah focus on these characteristics? Uh, who can tell me? What is the objective of Allah mentioning these characteristics to us? That's the question. What is the objective? Why does Allah mention these characteristics? Huh? To be one of them. So we can come and implement them in our lives. And that's why we need to pay close attention. And subhanAllah, as some of the scholars said, when you recite the Quran and you read the Quran, it's a book of, of tadabbur, to reflect upon. Just as a student who is going to take an exam, how does he go through the exam papers? He takes out his highlighter. I'm not saying to bring the highlighter in your, in your Quran, but nonetheless, to highlight it at least in your memory or write it down outside, the key points. What are these characteristics? We write them down, we know what they are. And then we ask ourselves, how am I when it comes to these characteristics? And when these, we always talk about the qawaid of the Quran, the principles of the Quran, when they become a principle that you focus on and make them a principle, they're going to automatically, when something happens in your life, they click in. They, it, 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 it's, it's like something that goes off in your mind. And that's what the Muslim wants to train himself to do. And you're going to see an example in this verse, but even especially in the second verse of how to deal with ignorant people when they talk to you. Once you have this principle, it becomes something khalas. It's part of your life. When a beggar comes up to you in the streets, when you go to a poor country, especially, they come up and they start pulling you by the sleeve and please give me some sadaqah. How do you reply to them? How do we deal with the beggars as Muslims? When it comes to the beggar, the one who's asking, don't be harsh in the way you reject them. You don't have to give them. It's up to you. But you can't be harsh in the way you reject them. We know this from the principle that we were taught in Surah al duha So these are principles that have to be part of our lives. So the first thing is, that they walk on the earth easily. Meaning that they are, have tawadu. They're simple. They're humble in the way they walk. In Surah Luqman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقْصِدْ وَقْصِدْ فِي مَشِّكْ وَقْضُدْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ And be moderate in your pace and lower your voice. إِنَّ أَنْكَرَ لَسْوَاطِ لَصَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ That indeed the most disagreeable of sounds is the voice of the donkey. SubhanAllah. So be moderate in your pace and lower your voice. Teaching a Muslim how to walk. That you walk someone who's not arrogant. Someone who doesn't want, look at me. Huh? And this is very important in the days of social media when you have all of these YouTube and Instagram stars who always say, look at me, look at me, look at me. And that has an impact on us. We start to do the same thing and fall into the same traps of shaitan. But does this mean that we should walk as Muslims, as miskeen? We walk, we lower our head, just walking. Miskeen, we're, we're poor individuals, we're weak individuals. No, that's not what it means. How did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to walk? He said it is as if he was coming, ascending from, from, come, 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 from coming from, uh, any, from altitude, from above. It was as he was coming from a high place, coming down Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. He walked strongly. He would walk fast Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. One time Aisha radiallahu anha, she saw a man walking, you know, like the miskeen, he's humble. And he's feeling the sakin and the tranquility as he walks. Bismillah, bismillah. One of the, one of, walking like that. And Aisha said, Man, what's wrong with this guy? And they said, He's from the Qura. He's from the Qaris. 
meaning that he's someone who's pious. And she said that, may Allah have mercy upon Umar, rahimahullah, who had passed away. And he said, he said, because he was someone who was from the leaders of the Qaris. He was from the main Qaris of the Quran. But yet, he would walk strongly and he would speak loudly. And if he hit, he would hit hardly. This is how the Muslim walks. But he stays away from being arrogant. And he's humble at the same time. You can walk confidently. Walk properly. Walk strong. That's how a man should walk, isn't it? But he shouldn't be showing off when he does. When you look at the importance of staying away from arrogance and how you walk. What did the Prophet وسلم, say about arrogance? لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر That the one who has an Adam's weight of kibr, of pride in his heart, he will not enter in the Jannah. And he told us a story alayhi salatu wasalam in the hadith that was narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. That a man was walking and he had two, a two-piece garment. His hair was well combed. He was very proud of himself. He looked good. So he was very proud of himself as he was walking. What happened to this individual? He said, suddenly, Allah made him sink into the earth. Allah made the earth swallow him. And he will go on sinking until the day of resurrection. May Allah, may Allah protect us, subhanAllah. Allah made the earth swallow him. And he will be punished like this, being swallowed until the day of judgment. But does this mean that we can't pay attention to how we look and make sure if we want to look good and dress nice? This question comes. And subhanAllah, the hadith we mentioned about the kibir, the arrogance, the one who has the Adam's weight of arrogance in his heart, the Sahaba, when they heard this from the Prophet وسلم, one of the Sahaba who was there, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Inna rajula yuhibbu an yakun thawbuhu hasanan wa na'aluhu hasana. That he's, a person likes uh, uh, to have nice clothes and nice shoes. He likes to look good. What did the Prophet وسلم, reply to him? Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal. That indeed Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. And He said that the kibir, arrogance, it is batarul haq wa ghamtul nas. That it's rejecting the truth and belittling people, looking down upon people. This is the kibir, the arrogance. And that individual who was so proud of himself, you'll find that he was looking down upon others. <coughs> SubhanAllah, when you look at how the Prophet وسلم, used to walk, as he, is, he was coming from a high place, alayhi salatu was salam. He would walk strongly, but without any type of arrogance. He looked good, alayhi salatu was salam, and how he dressed. He wasn't flamboyant. He didn't wear flashy clothes or expensive clothes, but he was clean. He looked good. His hair was well groomed. He smelled good, alayhi salatu was salam. And as he would walk down the street, looking good, walking as a strong man, alayhi salatu was salam, at the same time, he would be spreading the message of peace and the words of peace by saying assalamu alaikum to everyone that he saw alayhi salatu was salam. To those who he knew and those who he didn't. This is the sunnah, as we mentioned in a khutbah recently here. Passing the salams to those who you don't know and don't know. And he would always be smiling alayhi salatu was salam. And look at the impact of this. When you see someone who walks in a strong way, the Prophet ﷺ had broad shoulders, a flat stomach, and he had a proper rajal, proper man, alayhi salatu wasalam. He looked good, alayhi salatu wasalam, but at the same time, he was simple. You could see the radiance of iman, the nur of iman, and of his worship, alayhi salatu wasalam, glowing on his face. He's constantly smiling. He's constantly spreading peace in his actions and in his statements, alayhi salatu wasalam. Imagine the impact of seeing this individual walking down the street. How good it makes you feel. And subhanAllah, arrogance, one of the first places that it shows up is in how you walk. You find yourself, you, you, you think you, 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 you're proud of who you are. You're proud of, of what you have. 
You want to show off what you have. And you see, on the contrary, when someone is in a peaceful state, he's walking, as Allah mentioned, honan, easily and peacefully. That has an impact on your other actions as well. Pay attention. That has an impact on your other actions as well. <coughs> if you look at the next characteristic, if the ignorant people speak to them, they reply to them in words of peace. If you're someone who's walking who's arrogant, or if you're someone who's angry, how is it going to be your reply when someone says something to you, someone insults you? Who are you to insult me? And you're going to come back maybe with even something worse. Or if you're angry, you're going to come back with something equal or something worse as well. But if you're in a state of tranquility, of peace, you're spreading the word of peace. When you see the people, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, you're walking peacefully, you're walking easily. If someone insults you, it's going to be easy for you to reply to them in words of peace. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, when someone would insult him, he would say to him, assalamu alaikum. And imagine the impact it has. If someone were to assault you as you were driving, and this is quite common in, in Muslim countries, unfortunately, people getting upset, it's your problem, and they might say some, you know, different words, describe you as being different types of animals. Huh? And if you say to them, Assalamu alaikum, brother, and you keep going, what's the impact it's going to have on him? <clears throat> he thought you rolled down your window to insult him back, and you say to him, Assalamu alaikum, and you continue to go, he's going to be like, man, I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't good. He's saying, I look like the fool. He might be like, well, some, I say, he might say sorry to you as well, you know? He, at least, or at least he's going to feel it inside. There's four possible ways you can reply to someone ignorant who insults you. You can reply to them in a way that's equal to their, their reply. They curse you, you curse them back. Beep to me, beep to you. Huh? Or you can come with something that's even worse than that. That, hey, you said this to me, but where I'm from, we knock people out. I'll teach you a lesson. Huh? It's, a, it's even worse. Al-Muslim man salam al-Muslimun min lisanihi wa min yadi. The Prophet ﷺ, he taught us that the Muslim, meaning the true Muslim, is the one that the Muslims are safe from his tongue and from his hands. Huh? You have to train yourself to have patience. The third possibility is that you're quiet and you don't reply. And this needs patience, ya khuan. This is a, the religion of Islam is a religion of tarbiya, a religion of, of educating and training oneself. We educate ourselves of how we need to be, and then we go and implement. We train ourselves. It's not easy, wallah, ya khuan. Especially when someone does something that's ignorant. The other day, I was driving. This guy came and he cut us off. Me and the people in front of us, he cut us off. And then he got into the right lane, and the person in front of him stopped. So he came back again to the left and cut us off again. So when I blew the horn, because he almost ran into us, he gets upset. And he's like, hey, shriek, hey, what's going on? I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you cut us off twice. And you, now you have the audacity <laughs> to come and to do one of these to me? It, 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 to say something to me? So I said, Anyway, they call them a general call us. I have to train myself. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. I keep going. It's not easy. You have to train yourself to do it. Because even so, if you were to say something back to him, people would say, maybe you're right. Because he, he was the ignorant one. How could he do something like this? But here, what did the law say about these individuals? With a khatabahum al jahilun. If the ignorant ones, he was ignorant for doing that. Yes, may Allah help him and guide him. <coughs> but this is what the law is talking about in the, in the ayah. If the ignorant people talk to him, then you have to be the one who is smarter. You have to be the intelligent one. So the number three, we said we, we don't say anything back. You take it on the chin and you keep going. The fourth possibility, and this is the highest level, which is that you reply with words of goodness or with actions of goodness as well. One of the two. You say something peaceful, salam alaikum. Or you can make dua for him. Say something good to him. Yeah, may Allah give you Jannah. Yeah, imagine the impact it's going to have. Somebody calls you a himar, a kelb, a donkey, and a dog, and he's cursing at you and stuff like this. Uh, 
and then you say to him, Assalamu alaikum, Allah yatik al Jannah. May Allah give you the Jannah. It's like, wow, you know. So we'll come back with good. You'll be the better one. An amazing story, Abu Huraira radiallahu an. Someone came to him and cursed him. He insulted him. And he said right away, Allahumma, in kana sadiqan, faghfir li. When kana kathiban, faghfir lahu. Allahu Akbar. He said, oh Allah, if he was truthful in what he said about me, then forgive me. And oh Allah, if he was lying in what he said about me, then forgive him. Imagine the impact. SubhanAllah. And imagine that individual when he hears that, how it could change his life, how it could change his religious commitment, how it could change an enemy of Islam. How many stories have we heard of somebody actually accepted Islam? One of our brothers who was at a dawah table in the UK, when a lady came up to him and spit in his face. What would you do if a woman came and spit in your face? Because they have the YouTube videos now where the women want to act like men when they fight men. So the men say, you want to act like a man? I'm going to treat you like a man. And they beat him down. And some people say, you know what? They... <laughs> Some people might say they have, they, they're okay with that because she comes and hits a man, then he hits her back. He defends himself. I'm not saying that's what you should do, but I'm saying some people might have done that. But he's he now someone who's out there representing Islam, someone who is calling to Islam. What should his response be? He took out a tissue and took, then took out another tissue and he gave it to her and he said, there's still some you have on the side of your face and he wiped away the spit. Out of shame, she ran away. Two weeks later, she came back to apologize. She learned more about Islam, and a couple weeks later, she became his wife, alhamdulillah. The sabr, ah, opens up doors, alhamdulillah. Not just the doors of Jannah, the doors of the dunya as well, alhamdulillah. Huh? So subhanAllah, this is, this is, but it's not easy. You have to train yourself to do. One time, and look at subhanAllah, look at, look, look at the story, the, the, the verse in the Quran, we'll mention this. Because of the person who replies in this way. Either the, the person might, we say, might be guided, as we said in the story, or maybe, even if they're not guided 100%, instead of being enemies of Islam, they could become supporters of Islam. Or at least they're going to apologize for what they've done. And many stories we could give, subhanAllah, of how many people have been guided, of people who have, what, been enemies of Islam and then became to support the Muslims because they saw the reply of the Muslims when they were insulted, how they replied and how they were patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this meaning in Surah Fussilat. And pay attention to this ayah subhanAllah. When Allah said, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا And not equal are the good deed and the bad deed. This is the first thing. اِتْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Repel evil by a deed that is better. It's a principle. Does it, we say this is it? The, 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 one of the qawa'id of the Quran, one of the principles of the Quran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ And thereupon, the one whom between you is enmity, that you have a, a problem with him, you have an issue with him, it's as if he was one of your devoted friends. Meaning, he was your enemy in the, in the beginning. You had problems with him. But because how you treated him, how you replied to him, he now became one of your devoted allies, one of your friends, one of your supporters. How many times where a scholar has been insulted and he was patient and these individuals became his followers? How many times in the seerah when those who cursed the Prophet wasallam spread propaganda, spread lies, fought against the Prophet wasallam became the most devoted followers of the Prophet wasallam? Because the Prophet wasallam didn't come back with the same type of ignorant replies. As Muslims, we train ourselves according to the Quran. With their khatabuhum al-jahiluna, qalu salama. One time a man came to Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and he cursed him. He said something to him negative. And Abu Bakr was quiet radiallahu an. Then he said it a second time, and Abu Bakr was quiet. And then he said it a third time, and it became a bit difficult. So Abu Bakr replied to him radiallahu an. 
At this time, the Prophet وسلم, stood up and he left. Abu Bakr then followed him to see why the Prophet وسلم, left. And he said that there was an angel there defending you when you were what? Quiet. But as soon as you replied back to him, the shaitan came. And he said, that's why I got up because I wouldn't sit in the same place where shaitan was sitting. SubhanAllah. We let shaitan get the best of us. When we can't control our anger, when we have to reply. And many times, problems happen. We have to get the last word. Even between spouses. We argue, I have to get the last word. I have to put the last word. What the Quran, the Quran is training you to say words of peace. Look what Abu, Abu Hurairah said. If it's true, may Allah guide me. One of the Salaf from the early scholars, when his wife said to him, she was very angry, she said, you're a munafiq. And he said, no one knows me better than you. This is a reply to it. It's like, had an impact on her, subhanAllah. I'm a munafiq, huh? Yeah, munafiq, ah, you know. Nah, yeah, he, he came and replied. He said, nobody knows me better than that. That's what I am, that's what I am. You know me better, huh? Allah Akbar. And another story, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu an, a man cursed him. But this time he said nothing back to him. He kept saying it. He kept saying nothing back to him. And he said, hey, I'm talking to you. I mean you. And he said, yeah, I know you mean me. I know you're talking about me. And he said, I'm, and I mean to ignore you. Because he said, at the end, what you're saying, it's going to go with you in the grave. It's not going to go with me in the grave. These words that you're talking, you're going to take it to the grave. I'm not going to take it to the grave with me. Subhanallah. Abu Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, one time he was walking, same thing, someone was cursing him, saying negative things to him. And he said, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he reached his door to his house, he said to him, do you have anything else you would like to say? The man was shocked. He said, I've been cursing at you the whole time. I've been insulting you the whole time. Now you must, is there anything else you want to say? And he said, of course. He said, the whole time we've been walking, you've been increasing in my hasanat, in my good deeds, and you've been taking away my bad, my bad deeds. I'm taking my bad deeds, putting, putting them on you. You're losing your hasanat, giving me hasanat, and taking away my bad deeds from me. So alhamdulillah, I'm going to benefit from it, yom al qiyamah. You're the one harming yourself. The third characteristic, وَالَّذِينَ يُبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا And those who spend the night Prostrating to the Lord and standing in prayer. In sujood, in qiyam, standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying for Allah all throughout the night. All throughout the Quran, Allah praises the salihin, the pious. What does He say about him, about them all of the time? تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا That they remove their sides from their beds. They get up. And they what? Make dua to the Lord out of fear and out of hope. If you look into Surah al dhariyat when Allah mentioned what the muttaqeen, what the pious will have in the Jannah, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّةٍ وَعْيُونَ That the muttaqeen, the pious ones, they will be in gardens and springs, flowing springs. آخِذِينَ مَا آتَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ Enjoying, taking joy in that what their Lord has given them. Who are these individuals? Kanu qabla dhalika muhsineen. That they were before that, kanu qabla dhalika muhsineen. That they were before that from the muhsineen, from the doers of good. What is the first characteristic mentioned from these muttaqeen, these pious ones, these muhsineen, these doers of good? Kanu qalila min al layli ma yahjaroon. That they used to sleep but little of the night. The second thing, يستغفرون, And during the hours before dawn, they're seeking forgiveness. They're up praying at night, seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last third of the night, this is the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the sky of the dunya in a manner that's befitting with His majesty. And He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is there anyone making dua so I can answer his dua for him? Is there anyone seeking my forgiveness so I can forgive him? This is the opportunity. This is the time of the salihin, of the pious. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said about this prayer, 
the night prayer that it's sharaf al mu'min it's the honor of the believer the honor of the believer is him standing up at the in the night and praying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that it's the best of prayers after the fard is the night prayer the best of prayers after the fard prayer is the night prayer why is it the best of prayers imam ibn rajib al hanbali rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned he said there's three reasons three main reasons why it's the best of prayers after the fard he said because the night prayer is performed secretly where no one else can see if you go five times a day to the masjid people see you but usually when you get up at night maybe your 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 family maybe but the general people generally people don't see you and if your family's asleep they don't see you either so what is this it's closer to ikhlas it brings you closer to allah and it's something you do solely and sincerely for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless you're taking selfies and you on twitter i just got up to pray you take it at the, at the end, you know, you say, Astaghfirullah. That's what it's become a lot of times. We have to be careful, Ya Khwan. Allah is done. Hopefully, this ayat, inshallah, will train us to have true ikhlas, Ya Rabb. The second reason is it's a time of difficulty. The middle of the night, maybe you haven't got enough sleep, you slept a bit late, you're tired, and shaitan comes to you. He wants to, because he's strong during that time, by the way. He'll come to you and be like, hey, It's not fart, it's only Mustahab. The fart's coming. Your second alarm will wake you up for that. Just go back to sleep. You need to sleep. Uh, so you don't want to come to It's a difficult time. So that's another reason why it's so special, this prayer. Because if you can break the shackles of shaitan and you can get up, that's, that's not easy to do. And all of us know who have tried it. All of us who, who, who might pray it, some of us. that We know it's difficult. It's difficult to get up. You get up at 3.30 a.m. Instead, of, the alarm goes up at 5. That's okay. 5, 5 a.m. Is, is enough sleep. But 3.30, 4 o'clock, that's tough. Huh? And, all, and the third reason he said that the recitation, the tilawa of the Qur'an during that time, it's closer to be able to make khushur, or to have khushur, uh, tranquility in the prayer, and also to make tadabbur, to reflect and to tafakkur, and to think about the meanings of the ayat as you're reciting. It's, it's quiet, it's peaceful, you're reciting slow, you, you have time to reflect on the meaning of the ayat. One of the scholars who taught us in Medina, Sheikh uh, Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Shinqayti, uh, may Allah preserve him, he used to tell us in the lessons that the scholars said that sahib al-layl, the one who gets up and pray, prays at night, that the fear doesn't enter into his heart. That's, that's the level of the iman he gets. He becomes strong in his heart, strong in his iman. It brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prescribed the night prayer for the sahaba even in the time in Mecca. Even before the salat was made fart, he advised them to get up and to pray during the night prayer. Why? Because... It strengthens your iman. It brings you closer to Allah. It trains us to strive to be able to overcome difficulties. And if you're a Muslim who wants to strive for La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you need this. And that's why the scholars always talk about the night prayer. If you want to strive and do something for the ummah, then you have to get up and pray at night. It's not an option. When the Prophet wasallam arrived in Medina, they said from the first things that they heard him Say alayhi salatu was salam was the advice that he gave when he said, Afshu salam, spread the salams amongst yourselves, and to feed the people, and to establish the family ties, and pray during the night when people are asleep, you will enter into the Jannah easily. Imam Al Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was asked, Why do the people who pray during the night, why are their faces glowing and radiant with light? He said, Because they secluded themselves with the Rahman, so he gave them from his light. Subhanallah. You see the impact of the person who prays during the night, you see his face glowing. You see that he's someone who's not attached to this dunya. You see the impact and effect, even when you see that individual. I remember one of the scholars who taught us in the university. He wasn't very known, but he was very good in his teaching, mashallah. But you could see that he wasn't attached to the dunya at all. And you could see that he was from the people who would get up and pray at night. You could just see it in his face. And then when I got to know a bit about him, he said he prays long hours during the night. But you could see it on how he walks, on how he talks, on how he acts. You could just see the impact of the night prayer, how it had on him, subhanAllah. These are how many of the characteristics that we mentioned now? Huh? 
Three, okay, good, alhamdulillah. Good. So these are three of them, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll continue next week to mention the rest of them, inshallah ta'ala. We don't want to make the lectures too long. We're trying to keep them about 30 minutes. I'm going about 35, I believe. So we don't want to, want to keep it in that range. We don't make it too long where it gets boring. I mean, it is interesting. We could like to, we could like to do all of them now, but I think the issue of the, the, the time of the one hour, 20 minute, one hour, 30 minute lectures, it's a bit old. So we're trying to make them shorter, inshallah, simple and to the, and to the point so it'll be more beneficial for us. And we'll continue next week to reflect on these characteristics. Uh, until then, Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa ala bin Muhammad. If there's any questions, inshallah, ta'ala, we can have a little bit of, of Q&A, inshallah. Now, the brother is asking, there's a very important question and a very confusing question for many people, which is, can we pray night prayer or voluntary prayer in general during the night after we pray witr? And why is this question so important? Because many people after Isha, they pray, they pray witr. So they're thinking, now I, I wake up at 4 a.m., but I can't pray because I've already prayed witr. And this is not correct. It's permissible for you to pray any, the voluntary prayer after you've prayed witr, no problem. What's not permissible is for you to pray witr again. This is, this is what's not permissible. The Prophet وسلم, he said, La witrani fi layla. That there's no two witrs in one night. Meaning that if you prayed witr, you can pray after that. Two rakats, two rakats, two rakats, as much as you want. But you cannot pray a second witr after that. That's what's forbidden. So if you pray witr now and then you wake up at 4 a.m., you wake up at 3 a.m., you can't get back to sleep, get up, pray two rakats, four rakats, alhamdulillah. Yeah, the, the brother's asking, is it recommended to use alarm clock? Unless you have super iman that wakes you up without an alarm, bismillah, if you're from those people, and jazakallah khair. Other than that, I think most of us need alarm clock, alhamdulillah. And that's from, and he, actually it's from the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, that he's given us the, these tools that we can use to benefit us, inshallah ta'ala. When the, the alarm goes off, we know it's time. And it, you could even now, on, on many of the apps, you could, or, or many of the phones, you could even put like an adhan or something uh, that, that, to inspire you once you hear it, to wake up, inshallah ta'ala. Or, you know, or a reminder, or an ayah, or something like that. You could put, tatajafa janubuhum al madaja. Perfect, you could put that ayah as, as the alarm on some phones. And you wake up and you hear that, why not? So this is something you, know, you could put, and, and it's a tool that Allah has given us, so we should benefit from it, inshallah ta'ala. But if you wake up naturally, alhamdulillah, that's, that's beautiful. Huh? <laughs> okay, that's another important question. What counts as qiyam al-layl? Do I have to have fallen asleep and then wake up? Or can I pray at any time during the night? No, even before you go to sleep at night. The Qiyam al-Layl starts from now, after Isha. It's all Qiyam al-Layl. The Prophet ﷺ has been confirmed he prayed in the beginning of the night, that he prayed in the middle of the night, and that he prayed in the last third of the night. So all of these thirds he prayed in them, alayhi salatu wasalam. But most of the time he would pray when? The last third of the night. He would go to sleep and then wake up. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he used to pray at the, last, at the first third of the night. He would pray first, and then he would go to sleep uh, after that, radiallahu anhu. So whatever is more convenient for you. And some of our scholars recommended that if you can't pray in the beginning, then train yourself in the beginning to do it at the beginning of the night. And then move over and start to do it. Start to do what? At the uh, last third of the night. Or like the brother said, maybe you pray witr, and then you just get up and pray two rakats, maybe the last 20 minutes before the adhan. And then you start to train yourself. Then you add on another 10 minutes and another 10 minutes until you can start getting up the last third of the night in Shalom Ta'ala. Because what happens, a lot of times we commit, we get inspired, we hear about Qiyam al-Layl, we, we put the alarm clock on an hour and a half before Fajr. And maybe we, we might wake up the first day. Some of us might go back to sleep and, and miss Fajr after that, <laughs> unfortunately. Huh? Or that will be the last time we'll pray it for, for another two years until we get inspired again. So at least train yourself. That's just part of, your, of who you are every night before you go to sleep. Add two rakats before Fajr. Add four rakats, start making it longer, and then you can start praying your witr at that time as well. Or you can pray part of the qiyam in the beginning of the night, and then get up and pray the witr, the last third, inshallah. If you can just three rakats and make some dua, make some istighfar before the fajr, that's beautiful, inshallah. Ta'ala. You can even spread out like that instead of praying all at one time. The best way to deal with frustration. Ah, that's an interesting question, and a good question. And obviously, any, when it comes to frustration, you have to look at what is frustrating you. That's important to know as well. And Ask yourself, should it be frustrating me? Because a lot of times, many of the things frustrating us don't really deserve to be frustrating. Many of the things that make us angry, a lot of the times, they don't really de deserve to be angry. When you talk to someone who's angry, you start to remind them, and then you say, it, it doesn't really deserve you, actually. You know, someone and he cuts you off, and the things that you said on the road as you were driving, it didn't, didn't deserve that. He was wrong, yes. But the, I mean, you took it to another level. 
So this is this is some of the, and this is the, the 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 first thing. Then obviously in you know, seeking refuge in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, making dhikr, reading Quran, listening to Quran. And how many times? Like I always tell the story when I used to be a teacher, and you know, one of the most frustrating and difficult jobs. And back in the day, the teachers had sticks and stuff like that, so students were pretty good, you know. One brother said that uh, he was teaching with me at international school uh, here in the Gulf, and he said he visited a school in Somalia. Well, he was originally from Somalia. And he said that he had a, they had a, a break and the class had started. And he said the, the teacher took like extra five minutes talking to me and he hadn't gone to his class yet. And he said, aren't you concerned what's gonna be happening in the class? He said, they're probably like jumping around and screaming right now. He said, no, no, they wouldn't dare. You know, where we were teaching, yes, the kids would be climbing on the ceiling if the teacher took, it was five minutes late, but they, <laughs> it's a bit different. So teaching was very, very frustrating, very difficult job. Uh, especially uh, uh, with all of the preparation and the modern teachings, it's, it's actually not an easy job. And I, so I have a lot of respect for teachers, mashallah. One of the things that helped me deal with the frustration and the difficulty, I would go to the teacher's lounge and open up the Quran and start to read. SubhanAllah, as I thought I was going to go crazy, all of it was just removed. And I would relax, SubhanAllah. Yeah, with, the, with the Quran is one of, one of the ways. The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking, Refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go and make wudu. Calm yourself down. Pray two rakats. These are all ways, inshallah, to deal, to deal with frustration, inshallah ta'ala.